a young professor, I often sought advice from my friend, Dr. Bill Weldon, who served as a mentor for me in my teaching experiences. He was a man of great wisdom and great experience in being a, a master educator. And, but one of the things he would say to me often was teaching only occurs when learning takes place. It's the idea of getting the focus on the student learning and away from the focus on teaching. And that is my passion to help students learn. But there's often a disconnect and that disconnect sometimes is while my focus is on students learning and mastering the content, oftentimes I see students who are focused on the grade. And sometimes that grade gets in the way of learning. One of the things that Dr. Walden also said to me was ships are safest in the harbor, but ships are not built to stay in the harbor. That quote has spurred a lot of innovation in my experience. I like to take risk. I like to be innovative. I like to try new things, which is why I want to pilot this project of going gradeless this semester. Let me talk to you a little more about that. If you look at the history of grading, early colleges and early education didn't give grades. It actually started in about 1897 at Mount Holyoke in Massachusetts. You think about men who were great learners, Benjamin Franklin, Abraham Lincoln, Albert Einstein. These men were before letter grading systems, but they were great learners. They didn't get grades. And of course, we're all aware that grading doesn't always reflect learning. You might get a great grade, but not have learned what you really needed to learn. And conversely, you might be learning tons and not getting the best grade. I've recently been reading a book called Ungrading, by, uh, edited by Susan Bloom. It's a lot of articles by different professors and even some high school teachers. And so I've been, re I've been researching a little bit more about this new movement of going gradeless. Stanford University surveyed a bunch of uh, high school students a couple of years ago and discovered high levels of stress that were affecting their schoolwork. And that stress was often related to achieving grades. Dr. Judy Willis, a neuroscientist, has discussed that the strategies we use for teaching often create stress for students and cause them to not learn at the highest level. There are lots of problems with grading. It's not a perfect system. Different professors grade differently, even in the same courses. So the grades that a student might get from one professor could be totally different than they get from another professor in the same course, even if they were submitting the same work. So they're inconsistent. They're often very subjective. In the last few years, we've seen that grades can have systematic bias and produce inequity. And there's unintended consequences. Grades affect scholarship, athletic ability, and retention. Grades can also provoke academic misconduct. And sometimes in pursuing a good grade, I've had students who have cheated because of the stress of getting that, that A grade or finishing a project that they didn't understand. Grades can also discourage risk-taking and creativity. In a course like creating applications, we want to promote creativity and risk-taking. In addition to some professors starting to go gradeless, um, there is a gradeless movement in that some colleges as a whole are going gradeless. There's lot, lots of ways that institutions and professors are doing this. Oftentimes it's a pass-fail mark rather than a grade. And most medical schools, as well as law schools, use pass-fail rather than a letter grade. The reality is some of our best learning comes from making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. Dr. Sharam Heshmat wrote, the sensitivity to, to unexpected outcomes plays a key role in our ability to learn new things every day. We learn whenever anything unexpected happens, but not when things are predictable. Those, and so those mistakes help us learn. In contrast, highly predictable environments can lead to reduced attention. And mistakes help us to get a task right at the end and obtain a reward. In sports, we know that baseball players adjust to a pitcher where pitcher learns from the hitter in that battle between the two of them. Football teams at halftime go in and make adjustments to their game plan. They learn from mistakes. They learn how things aren't going well. And of course, in learning to drive a straight nail, we're all going to bend a few. Failing often leads to great success. So we see all the memes out there in terms of learning from our mistakes. Your last mistake is your best teacher. Mistakes are the stepping stones to learning. 
And failing is nothing more than the first attempt in learning. Some of our best authors get rejected starting out, but they learn to hone their craft. Unfortunately, our grading systems are often laden with expectations of success and may be punitive in punishing students as they learn. There's an equity issue here that is tied into grades and sometimes creates labels. Software development, though, is really all about making mistakes and learning from those mistakes and correcting those mistakes. Even the most seasoned programmers have to debug their code. And that's figuring out why their program doesn't work and changing it to make it better. That's part of, of programming. And we will do a lot of testing and debugging in this course. Most programming takes place in a team environment. But if you don't have a somebody to help you learn and debug your code, you'll see this little rubber duck there. Uh, there's been talk recently about having an inanimate object to explain your code to. So sometimes explaining your code to rubber duck can help you find the errors and help you make your code better. But software development is often done in teams. I have been guilty of not allowing my students to work in teams. I want to make sure my students understand what they're doing and not getting answers from another team member. Yet that's counterproductive to what you will experience in the industry. We develop software most often in teams. So what does this all mean for my Python class? Well, let me explain. Traditionally, in this asynchronous online class, I would send out a checklist each week of the topics we'd be cover, and then a checklist for you to do of learning activities as well as projects. And I would give you instructions for each of the projects or assignments as far as how they align to our course uh, learning outcomes. The assignment itself, I give you screenshots, maybe some instructions, some tips, and how to test and debug the things to look for. And I would then have you submit your assignment to Canvas, where I would download it and grade it based on a rubric. And in Canvas, you will find a schedule for our semester, week by week, the topics that are covered, and the projects or assignments for that week. You see that most weeks we have two or three assignments for that week. And each one of those I'll give you instructions for. And again, you would turn those in, I would grade them, and, and return those back to you. I also provide a grade book. And everything in this course aligns to course level outcomes that are discussed in the syllabus. And some assignments are worth one point, some are worth maybe seven points based on how many learning outcomes that assignment entails. As we get into more complex assignments over the course of the semester, you'll see they're usually worth more and more points. Starting out, there'll only be one or two points. Now, none of that has changed except for you will not submit your assignments to Canvas. In this particular example, I simply have crossed out the instructions on submitting your assignment. I'm not going to grade your assignments. I will help you with them. I will, I will look at your assignment if you're having problems and give you some feedback. But I'm not planning to issue a grade. There is a grading rubric that is provided into how I would normally grade that project. And I'm going to still encourage you to use that spreadsheet that I provide in tracking your progress. But you will not submit those for grading. Instead, each week, I'm going to have you do a self-assessment and a reflection on how your learning is going. Again, I want to shift that from focusing on grades to focusing on learning. So each week, I will have some things that I hope you've learned that week, and you're going to respond as to how you did, how you think you're doing. Now, we adopted a little system here based on space travel, and this is sort of in recognition of Dr. Cyan Proctor, our geoscientist professor who went to space last year aboard the SpaceX and was the pilot for that spaceship. So kind of tying into that celebration, for each topic, you're going to respond how you're doing. And the four levels here are all systems go, trajectory off target, Houston, we have a problem, or crashed and burned. And you see they're kind of color-coded from green, yellow, to red. I've already placed X's in all the green columns. So if you're doing really well, you don't need to do anything as far as changing those. But if, for example, you're struggling on how to cast between data types, simply move the X from the all systems go column to the one that best fits. This is a way of giving me feedback on how I can best help you. I'm also gonna have some very specific questions for you to answer, usually related to the projects that were due that week. So here in week two, you have three projects, triangle calculator, pennies to dollars, and temperature conversion. And I give you some specific scenarios as far as testing and debugging. 
So the bottom line is, did they work? Did you get the output that was anticipated given the input? You should always be in the habit of thoroughly testing and debugging your applications. And if you were to answer no to any of these, I want you to go back and look at your code, look at your design, and make changes. Now, some of the projects, I give you step-by-step -step instructions through YouTube videos. And traditionally, I would do that for maybe a quarter of the projects, but the other three-fourths of the course projects, you would watch videos related to content and then apply that content in solving the problem. What I hope to do this semester, time willing, is to give you solutions, my solutions, if you get hung up somewhere. Again, I want you to learn more so than worrying about you getting the grade. Learning is our number one goal here. So if you can learn from my solution, I'm going to make that available to you. If you can learn from helping each other, you are good to do that. If you can learn from somebody else outside of this class, maybe you have a sibling or a parent who knows programming and software development, they're welcome to help you learn and help you solve these problems. At the end of the week, then I also want you to provide some comments and maybe questions here. So you must, each week, provide a paragraph or so about how you think you're doing. What are you struggling with? What problems are you having? What are your questions? And I will try to answer those. So this is the only thing you need to submit. This has to be done each week by Sunday midnight. And that's all on the schedule. That's all well and good, Mr. H, but how are you going to grade me at the end of the semester? Because our institution does require you to get a letter grade. A, B, C, D, or F. Or a withdrawal. Here's the kind of radical part of all this. You're going to choose your grade. Now, you're going to actually request a grade. I shouldn't say you choose your grade. You're going to request a grade of A, B, or C based on how you think you're doing, what you think you deserve. You can also choose to withdraw if you feel like you're not doing well in the course. For those who maybe aren't doing well and who are um, on a scholarship who might be adversely affected by getting withdrawal, you can choose a D. I don't give Fs in this course now. If you stick with me to the end, you'll get at least a D or higher, and hopefully you'll get a C or higher. Now, you might request an A, and I might go back and look at your reflections and go, you know, I don't think you deserved an A, and we'll have a conversation. But I want to take your learning really into count in terms of what your grade should be. Now, there's also, over on the right-hand side, a class content assessment. So I'm listing here 30 things in this course that you should have learned and hopefully mastered what grade would you give yourself on each one of those? That cumulatively will help drive your grade. Now, I said I wasn't going to have you submit any assignments, but you should maintain all of your assignments. If there's a dispute that you think you deserve an A, and I'm questioning that, I may ask to see some of your assignments. So make sure you retain all of those. But for the most part, I want you to have a dialogue on where you think you fall on this continuum of a letter grade in light of your the class content and your learning that content. Now, two other things I want to point out. There will be a final exam at the end. That is a graded exam. In order to get an A or a B, you must pass that final exam. Now, that passing does not mean you get an A on the exam. You can get a C on the exam and still earn an A in the course or a B in the course. The exam will basically cover this material on the right-hand side in terms of the class content. So if you feel like you've mastered this content, you will have no problem doing the exam and passing it. So that's required for an A or B. It's not required for a C. In fact, you can choose to take a C and not take the final exam. The other thing you must do if you want an A is I want you to create your own project. I want you to create a project where you use the content you learned in this class to create your own C-sharp application. It does not use everything we talked about, but I want to see that you can design a project and use it. But you will submit this form to me at the end of the semester. And we'll have a dialogue about the grade you choose. I'm really hoping, for the most part, to not disagree with you and to give you the grade that you want. So the course is really on the honor system. I'm hoping that this will relieve some of the stress for you, but will also encourage you to learn and master the content. So that's how we're going grade list this semester. I'm looking forward to this. This is a totally new thing for me, um, but I'm excited about this opportunity. I'm excited about where this can go and how this might impact your learning. So I hope you're ready to go for it. Let's have fun. If you just jumped into this video and haven't seen the prior videos to this, I invite you to check out my Python playlist of videos.
And if you'd like to be alerted to future videos that I create, you can click my picture up in the top right and subscribe to the channel.